Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our Webinar Wednesday program. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They are recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 300 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you have questions for our speaker, we will have her information on the last slide of the presentation today. A special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, for making these webinars possible. The NBSBC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. And now about us. We work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. More information is on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach almost 18,500 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. And now to introduce our speaker, Anne-Marie Tavella. Welcome, Anne-Marie. We are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. So next. Today we're going to be discussing the negotiation of subcontracts. Um, I'm going to be focusing on the particular clauses you'll want to look for as you're um, negotiating subcontract agreements. Next. There is no set definition for what constitutes a subcontract. There can be subcontracts that are three pages long and subcontracts that are 100 pages long. It all depends on the nature of the work and um, the who you're contracting with. Some prime contractors have extensive subcontract forms. You may have your own forms that are um, that include the clauses you think are important. The basic terms of a subcontract are the work that's being contracted for, the time you'll be allowed to do that, so the length of the contract, how much you're going to be paid to do the subcontract work. And quite often, the prime contract um, will determine the subcontract requirements. Um, prime contract subcontractors quite often are not very familiar with prime contracts, and I'll talk about that a lot as we go. Next. I do want to take a moment to talk about purchase orders, which won't be addressed in today's presentations. They are similar to, but different from subcontracts. Purchase orders generally are limited to the purchase of goods. They are governed by the Uniform Commercial Code, which has um, various regulations and requirements as to um, the rejection and acceptance of goods. Um, sometimes purchase orders will have their own terms that the UCC supplements. Um, in contrast, subcontracts are governed by common contract law. Um, there's the basic offer, acceptance, and consideration that's required to create an agreement. Um, and quite often they include the um, purchase of goods and services, which is somewhat different. Purchase orders usually do not involve in any way the, the purchase of services. Next. The first step in negotiating a subcontract is usually bidding. Um, when you're bidding on a subcontract, uh, or on a prime contract before the subcontract is negotiated, you want to make sure as you're preparing your bid or proposal that you're familiar with the prime contract terms and requirements. Um, you want to look at um, what the requirements are for the work that you're bidding on. Um, you want to specifically look for language that is um, objective versus specification. That is probably one of the biggest traps. Um, specifications, um, everyone's familiar with them to the extent you do. Um, contracting, but they're, they, they're, the word specific is right there. They give you direction. They give you the criteria that um, you're supposed to follow in order to perform the work. Objectives in contrast are um, vague. They generally, outside of the design build world, um, objectives really don't give you a lot of direction as to how the work should be done. It gives you an end goal. Um, it's a lot easier to fight over whether you've met an objective than whether you've met a specification. So the extent you can um, revise terms to be more of a specification versus an objective, that's good. You also want to look at what the warranty requirements are um, and make sure that um, to the extent they go downstream to your supply or your sub subcontractors that the warranty language is matching. If you're providing a piece of machinery that has a one-year warranty, you want to make sure your subcontract matches that warranty length. Um, you want to look at where who 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 owns the risk. Um, we'll talk about that more a little bit later when we discuss indemnity. Um, but you also want to look at what's included, what's excluded, um, what you're actually agreeing to. 
um, to make sure you're not just aware of that, but what, you're, what is actually being included within your bid. Um, it's important to keep records as you go through this process. Um, if you end up in a situation later where you're trying to negotiate a change order or you do end up in a claim, you want to be able to um, demonstrate how you justified on the information you were given while you were bidding and what you relied on. It's particularly important because um, when you have pro a turnover with your employees, if the person who prepared the bidder estimate has left, you want to make sure there's records so you do have some understanding of how that got um, decided. Next. Um, this is a list of the primary clauses, which we're going to be discussing in more detail today, so I won't really go through the list, but I just wanted to give um, one slide where you can see them all, where what, you, what you're going to be wanting to look for as you negotiate your subcontract, and these are the clauses you want to pay particular attention to. Next. Um, the, both the incorporation of your bid and the order, um, or the, what they call the order of precedence, is very important because this determines what is your subcontract. Quite often you'll get, you know, a document that, you know, maybe 20 or 30 pages that says subcontract agreement, but quite often the entire agreement is listed as being the drawings, the specifications, the prime contract terms. You want to make sure you are, um, as you're negotiating your subcontract, that you understand the world of the, what you're agreeing to. Um, also, you want to be clear as to what assumptions you're making to the extent you're agreeing to do things that are conditional that needs to be very well spelled out. Um, also, uh, you want to make sure it's quite often your bid will be incorporated into your subcontract, but there's generally a clause that says to the extent there's a conflict between your bid and the subcontract, the subcontract governs. That can be particularly problematic if you have exclusions within your bid that are not reflected in the subcontract. In the situation where the subcontract governs, um, you may be required to provide the very items that you tried to specifically exclude. So um, you want to make sure that either your the conflict says that your bid governs or whatever exclusions are in your bid are also incorporated in the subcontract and there's no um, ambiguity as to what you're agreeing to do and what you're not agreeing to do. Next. Obviously, payment is very important. Um, that's why you're entering into this agreement, is so you can get compensated for the work that you're performing. Um, you want to look for the payment terms and what rights the prime contractor might have to withhold payment from you. It's very common for there to be a withholding right. Um, and the, if you're doing you know, federal work, there's the Prompt Payment Act that can come into play, which would um, not allow the prime contractor to withhold indefinitely. They have to. Um, perform certain steps if they're withholding, but when you're looking at your subcontract, you want to make sure you're aware of what those steps are. Obviously, um, if you can negotiate um, just to revise any withholding agreement to be, the more narrow you can make it, the better, because that would limit their right to withhold your money. Um, if, there's, if they're allowed to withhold for a cure period, you want to make sure that's clearly defined so that way you can make sure you're addressing whatever concerns the, the prime contractor has in order to ensure you get timely paid. Um, there are requirements, like I mentioned, under the Prompt Payment Act, so these clauses must comply with that. Um, and then there's the, the timing of payment, which we'll discuss in the next two um, slides. Next. Um, the most common payment term you'll see in a subcontract is pay when paid. Um, it states that payment will be made when it's received from the owner, but the risk of non-payment still lies with the general contractor because this type of clause is considered a timing mechanism. Um, so even if the owner does not pay, the prime contractor is still required to pay a subcontractor within a reasonable time. It doesn't matter if this reasonable time language is, is included in the clause or not, they're still required to pay that. Um, pay you within a reasonable time, and pay when paid is is a is preferable. Um, so if you have this type of clause that you you should be fairly comfortable, um, it's pay if paid that can cause more problems, which is the next slide. Next. Pay if paid places the risk of a non-payment from the owner onto the subcontractor. Um, if the owner doesn't pay, you don't get paid, and it's considered. Um, a condition precedent clause and it requires specific language. So the language you want to be looking for and um, to try to negotiate out of is unless and until or if and only if. Um, courts don't like pay if paid clauses because of the risk 
placed on the subcontractor. Um, so they are only enforceable if the terms are clear, if they're not ambiguous. Um, there are several states that won't allow pay if paid clauses, which are listed here in the slide. And so if you have a pay if paid clause, if you can negotiate um, that clause, you want to try to turn it into a pay when paid clause, because that is better for subcontractors. Um, but even if you're a prime contractor and you have a pay if paid clause, you need to know that it could be considered void if you um, don't use these specific words or depending on which state you're working in. Next. Changes are um, quite often arise, particularly in construction contracts. Um, and one of the biggest um, steps in terms of changes that you want to make sure you are familiar with when you're negotiating your subcontract is notice provisions. Um, you want to know how you can give that notice and when you need to give that notice. You want to make sure if there's a reference to the prime contract requirements that you can meet those. Um, sometimes notice clauses are very brief. You, can, you have to provide notice within 48 hours or 72 hours, and if you don't um, make that contractual notice, your your claim or your your change order, um, you're, you may not be entitled to it. Um, even if the prime contractor or the owner has actual notice, there are several states that construe notice provisions strictly. So even if the other side, the, the owner or the prime contractor is aware of the the change, if you do not provide the contractual written notice, you still can lose your claim. Um, it's particularly important in the case of differing site conditions, which can hugely increase the cost of a construction project. Um, you also want to make sure notice clauses are flowed down to your subcontractors um, because if they encounter a differing site condition or a change that needs to be sent up the chain, you want to make sure you're being timely notified of that condition. Next. Um, when you're looking at the changes clause or the, the changes portion, change order portion of your subcontract, you want to make sure that you are prepared to comply with those requirements, what is going to be required to submit a change order proposal, um, what substantiation you're going to have to have. You, need, you should know this up front so as you're moving forward, um, you're not scrambling to try to create documentation um, when you do encounter a change and need to negotiate um, a change order. You also want to make sure you're familiar with you know, false claims representations and what, what is going to be required if you need to certify whatever amount you're requesting. Um, you also want to look at how recovery may be limited. If you're limited to what's recovered from the owner, you want to take note of that. If you can negotiate that out of your subcontract, that's better because you've, you, you can maintain your right against the prime contractor regardless of what happens with the owner. Um, but you want to look at um, what is going to be required in order for you to get that change order so you're prepared for that going forward. Next. Um, if you end up in a situation where a change order can't be issued or for any other um, number of reasons you may end up in a dispute, you want to know, again, there's often notice provisions for disputes. Um, there's requirements that you have to submit um, uh, notices in writing or you state your position in writing. Um, if those are time periods are very short, you want to try to negotiate them to be longer. You also want to make sure that if a dispute does arise, you're aware of what steps you need to take. You may have to request mediation. That's quite common before you can file a lawsuit. Um, you also want to make sure that you know where if you end up filing a lawsuit, you, you will be doing that. Um, and what the obligations are. If you have a design build contract, subcontract, you want to look at whether there are pass through provisions against the designer for um, you know, delays or um, cost impacts that the designer might cause. And um, you want to make sure that you are, there's not necessarily negotiation that goes with these clauses except for the notice periods, but you do want to make sure you're familiar with those as you enter into the subcontract so you know if a dispute arises what steps you need to take. Next. Quite often, subcontracts have pass-through requirements for claims involving the owner. Sometimes these are incorporated from the prime contract, so again, it's really important that you're familiar with the requirements of the prime contract, particularly for claim um, requirements. Um, sometimes the subcontract will place the, um, the, the obligation to pay for the, the past the, the claim on the subcontractor. So if you want to look for that, if you can um, negotiate that out and make it the prime contractor's responsibility um, to pass the claim through and to take on that burden, you want to know what your obligations are. You also want to 
um, know if the contractor does not have an obligation to include you. They can often, um, subcontractors state the prime contractor can pursue a claim on behalf of the subcontractor without the subcontractor's agreement or involvement. It's obviously better if you have some obligation. Sometimes there will be a separate pass-through agreement. Usually that's not addressed in your subcontract, but you want to try to negotiate so you have more control. Um, and sometimes that may be conceding that you'll cover the cost of pursuing a pass-through claim, but it's better, obviously, if you can um, have a seat at the table and argue your own claim. Um, often you'll see, uh, more and more, you'll see requirements to stay other proceedings, which usually relate to Miller Act claims. If you're a subcontractor, you do want to try to negotiate um, to delete those requirements. You don't want there to be a requirement to stay proceedings while you're um, pass-through claim is pending with the owner. That can take years if you end up in a situation where you have a claim pending in the Court of Federal Claims, um, and quite often you can get a lot more leg leverage against the prime contractor if you can file a Miller Act lawsuit. Um, but as a prime contractor, um, having a requirement to stay other proceedings um, is an important clause, and you want to try to keep that in your disputes clause to the extent you can. Next slide. As mentioned earlier, um, risk shifting is very important. Um, indemnity clauses are usually how um, you protect your the other each side protects themselves for from the negligence of the other party. What's important when you look at an indemnity clause, which often subcontractors sort of glaze or well, everybody glazes over since they tend to be very legally written. Um, you still want to look for certain buzzwords that I've, I've bolded here in this slide. The obligation to defend is important because that can be very expensive. You have the obligation to step in and hire an attorney for um, the prime contractor or their other subcontractors or the owner. That can be um, quite substantial in terms of the cost of that. You also want to look for how um, broad the clauses. Generally, they are limited to bodily injury and property damage, which is what you'd want. Um, sometimes it'll simply say all claims or all damages or all injuries, which can include not just third-party claims, but direct claims. Those That's very broad language, which you'd want to try to narrow, if at all possible, to be limited to, um, like it says here, bodily in injury and property damage. You also want it, want it to be as narrow as possible in terms of limiting it to your negligence. Um, the indemnity clauses that try to get you to indemnify another party for their negligence are generally um, not valid. They're considered a void under the law, um, but usually it's not uncommon to see them try to be um, written more broadly. So maybe there's, you know, to the extent partial negligence or contributory negligence um, that can be apportioned. Those are generally acceptable, but um, as you're negotiating a subcontract, the key when you're looking at indemnity clauses, try to make it um, as narrow as possible, and you also want to see whose negligence you're um, obligated for. So in this clause, you'll see here, it includes subcontractors, subcontractors, and anyone employed by your subcontractor. So um, if you are required to indemnify for the actions of your subcontractors, you want to make sure that that same obligation is flowed down. So those subcontractors um, are all also obligated to indemnify you. So if you end up having to indemnify the prime contractor for their actions, you can then send that also down the chain. Um, so you do want to make sure whatever subcontracts that you're issuing have similar indemnity clauses. Next. Termination for default is, um, so, sometimes this is included within a default clause or disputes clause. Sometimes it's a separate clause. Um, sometimes they it will be a clause that incorporates the procedures from the prime contract. So again, it's important to know the requirements and terms of the prime contract. Um, what you want to be looking for when you're negotiating a subcontract is what obligations they ha the prime contractor has to give you a notice to cure and the time period for that notice. Um, and cure period, sometimes there will be very short, 24 hours, 48 hours. You want to try to extend that as much as possible, um, if you can get it to be five days, seven days, um, because if you're given a notice to cure, you want to make sure you actually have the ability to cure whatever the issue is within the time period, and quite often one or two days is just not an adequate amount of time to fi fix a um, alleged default. 
Um, you also want to look at what the um, prime contractor is entitled to. Can Do they have the right to take over the work, which may include their right to take the equipment that you're using um, to basically take over for you um, and, and what those steps are. Um, if you have obligations to provide a recovery plan or a schedule, you want to make sure you understand what those obligations are. And um, in the event that you are terminated for default, you do also want to make sure that there's clear um, appeal procedures. It, is there a next step that you can appeal or do you end up in a lawsuit or if you, do you have to go to mediation first and, and what those obligations are? The, really the key here is the cure period because that's usually where um, you can have the, the most chance to avoid um, uh, the actual default from happening. Next. Um, you don't always see termination for convenience clauses within a subcontract. When you do, usually they relate to um, the right to terminate the contract, subcontract for convenience in the event the prime contract is terminated for convenience. Um, generally, it will tell you what your sort of recovery would be if you're terminated for convenience. Um, this is more in the federal contract world, but sometimes private contracts will have termination for convenience clauses. Um, it's almost it's, it's very, very rare to see a subcontract form that would allow a subcontractor to terminate for convenience. There are forms out there that include that right, but um, I don't see them be, get used very much. So um, the key here is just to know if you are terminated for convenience, what you'd be entitled to, so you can make sure to price that and close out the contract appropriately and what you'll be entitled to. Next slide. In the federal contract world, flowdowns are very important. Um, there are FAR clauses that are mandatory that must be flowed down to subcontractors and sub subcontractors. So, if you you'll often get an attachment to your subcontractor, which are the mandatory flowdowns, and you should know which of those FAR clauses should be flowed down to your subcontractors. Um, they're often incorporated by reference, so you don't even get to see the full clause. But the FAR is available online if you're not familiar with it. Um, it's not always an issue on smaller size subcontracts. Usually there's a dollar threshold associated with flow down clauses. Um, but if you have a larger dollar subcontract, it's important that you're aware of what your flow down obligations are. And really it's important that you're flowing those down to your subcontractors. So as you're reviewing your subcontract, you wanna make sure to know what is, again, this goes to what's included and what's not included in your subcontract agreement. Next. Um, there's always a myriad of legal clauses, um, most of which get glazed over. There's really not much to negotiate here, but it is important that you're aware. Sometimes there are things that you'd want to negotiate. Um, more and more you'll see, I've been seeing clauses that don't allow either side to get attorney's fees in the event of a, dis of a dispute, and that's often to discourage subcontractor claims and subcontractor ideas that if you file a lawsuit, you'll be able to get your attorney's fees back. Um, so that may be something you'd want to negotiate around. You also want to look at if you had to file a lawsuit, where would that lawsuit get filed? If your subcontractor located in Texas and your projects in Maine, you may end up having to file a lawsuit in, in Maine and have to be familiar with the laws of Maine. So you want to know what those obligations are. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you also should know whether you'd be obligated to go to um, potentially arbitration, so you have an arbitration demand versus filing a lawsuit. Um, and also look at what the damages may be limited to. There are quite often um, subcontracts don't allow for indirect or consequential damages, um, and the way you price your claim can be limited. So if you don't price your claim collect correctly, um, you may not be able to pursue it. And as you're negotiating your subcontract, you want to make sure that your cost systems, your accounting systems are prepared to price the claim in a way that would be accepted. Um, and if, if if you would if not if you're not capable of doing that you may want to try to negotiate out some of the limitation of damages clauses. Next, um, this is just kind of a summary of some of the things we've talked about today. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is to read the whole subcontract and the terms of conditions. Edit the unacceptable terms. Try to revise. There are definitely prime contractors who will push back, but the worst thing that they can say is no. Um, and if you are able to negotiate um, out some of these terms that you don't like or are less acceptable to you, that only increases your legal position. 
you want to again make sure your exclusions are clear that what you're not going to do is as clearly stated and it's not vague and it's not overridden by another subcontract term um, keep documentation of your negotiation so you know what you did and why um, and the last point um, as an attorney I'll say no one to use the phone email is great it gives you a, a time and date stamp for what was said and when um, but sometimes it's better to have a phone conversation and it's better to not have a record so if you need to get on the phone with the prime contractor you're working with sometimes it's good to hash things out over the telephone and that is the end of our presentation this morning well this morning depending on where you are today thank you and marie for a great presentation and sharing your time with us and thank you to everyone who joined us the recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Please join us this Friday as we cover each part of the FAR and join us next Wednesday for more hot topics on federal contracting.